Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Carr. Thank you very much, uh, and I uh, thank the minister for uh, her outline. I'm a member of the committee that she spoke of. Uh, I think she's probably been uh, a little generous in her interpretation of the committee's response. Uh, the nature of this committee is that it is concerned and has repeatedly expressed its concern at the growing amount of legislation that is now contains material which effectively allows the detail of policy questions to be left to a subordinate legislation by way of uh, these uh, regulations. And that was the thrust of the correspondence to the minister and, and the reason why the questions were asked, why can't these matters be contained in the primary legislation? And to which the minister has responded as uh, so often the case is, look, this is just an administrative matter and doesn't uh, require a substantive amendment to the legislation. Now, the committees thank the minister for his response because there has been some movement in the government's position, namely to adjust the explanatory memorandum to explain the circumstances under which, but it's not to say that the committee is satisfied with the minister's response. Now, the Labor Party is opposing this legislation and will express uh, our disappointment in the government's position in that vote. But it should be not in any way put to, to the Senate that the position that's been outlined is an acceptance of the government's position. When the committee says we'll leave it to the Senate, draw these matters to the attention of the Senate, leave it to the Senate to make a judgment call on it, that's uh, simply a mechanism by which the committee says we're not happy with what's happened, but it is. Uh, we acknowledge that there has been some movement by the government, but it's not satisfactory because these are questions that should have been contained in the primary legislation and outlined clear guidance as to the mechanism by which exemptions will be raised in the future as they, to the direction to uh, the uh, policy officers in the department uh, as to the way in which they administer this legislation. Because it's uh, not simply, it's just not good enough to say, look, we need the flexibility uh, because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Now, that's an age-old excuse within this, uh, when the Commonwealth Public Service these days, uh, and to take away the responsibility of the parliament to make decisions about what is appropriate and what is not, particularly on policy questions. Now, I've raised particular concerns about the way in which TEXA is functioning at the moment, especially in regard to standards. And I've syndicated that I intend to pursue this with some vigour at the next uh, round of estimates, because the way in which we are seeing a number of private colleges now being moved into a categories of universities, I think, requires further explanation. And where we have a series of Bible colleges being promoted as universities, we're entitled to know under what circumstances those uh, uh, decisions have been made, against what criteria they've been made. And this is the sort of thing we got, we, I think we're entitled to pursue, in, in, uh, uh, and we certainly will at the estimates. And so when it comes to the question of charges, and this bill will contain increases in charges up to some 700 per cent for some categories. These are charges which inevitably will be passed on to students, inevitably. So the two questions that concern me about this bill, it's not just the issue of fee recovery, it's the effect of the increased charges and the costs that they will have on students, given the way in which these charges inevitably will be passed on. And it's the, my concern goes to the question of standards, particularly research standards, given that we passed legislation only in February, which uh, now seems to have led to circumstances where there's been a series of private colleges being shunted into the category of universities in a manner which I think requires further uh, explanation. So there are two questions, fee rises and standards and the mechanism by which that occurs. Now, for the minister to say, well, look, you know, we've done the right thing by it, we've made some statement in regard to the explanatory memorandum, doesn't go anywhere near far enough. And as I say, the Labor Party is opposing this legislation because this is a pretty ham-fisted way to do business. 
It reflects a very poor understanding of the way in which the education system actually operates, and it demonstrates, in my judgment, a movement by this government by stealth, by stealth, to fundamentally change the way in which the higher education system in this country operates, and to, to see uh, the circumstances where there's a considerable shift away from public provision towards the uh, what some vice chancellors used to call the Mar and Park kettle operations. I look forward to some of these colleges, and I see one of them today has moved to extend the vocational, the, sorry, the va the the the, uh, the uh, vacation uh, considerably to try to make up savings to force people to actually use various entitlements up because of their financial circumstances as such. Uh, and they did so without consultation, without any engagement with the workforce, and bringing into practice, I think, uh, some, some measures which I think really do uh, demonstrate an alien culture to the way in which the tertiary sector and the education sector in this country has operated traditionally. Senator, oh, sorry, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Acting Deputy President, and I thank Senator Carr for those questions, and I'll deal with them uh, in turn. But first of all, can I say, uh, generally, the claims uh, by uh, Senator Carr are, I think, complete rubbish. Uh, since 2009, and these have been again promoted by uh, many of the speakers in this chamber, are simply wrong, in relation, particularly in relation to the funding of higher education. And the facts are this that since 2019, total funding to the higher education sector has actually increased from $17.3 billion to $20.4 billion in 2021, 17% increase in just two years. This includes an additional one-off boost of $1 billion to the University Research Centre, and Senator Carr asked about the Research Centre, to maintain the capability of Australian research during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, that research funding did cease in the 2021-22 budgets, uh, but they, that was a one-off payment, which was very, very clear. Uh, if any of those opposite had any mathematical skills at all, they would know that when you don't include that one-off additional funding, uh, these decreases they keep crying on disappear because it was a one-off payment, like so many other payments we have done to get this nation through COVID-19. And the figures in the budget papers also exclude the higher education loan program, the HELP outlays. Including HELP outlays shows the government overall funding to universities in 2021 was in fact $20.4 billion, which is an increase of 37 per cent since we came into government uh, when those opposite were no longer in government, were booted out by uh, electors. But no matter how many times we say the facts, and they are very clearly facts, they're in the budget papers. Uh, no matter how many times we repeat this, those opposite do not listen and they keep peddling what are clearly lies. So Senator Carr asked a number of other questions and I'll happily in turn deal with all of those. So firstly, the question in relation to why, does the, why is the bill needed and how is it going to be funded? So these bills give effect to a 2018-19 budget measure to implement cost recovery arrangements for Tesco in line with the Australian government charging framework. The framework links the costs of those who generate the need for them, in this instance, to higher education providers. And these costs are currently borne by taxpayers, and we believe it is only right that those who are receiving the services pay for them. So the subject of these bills is the creation of an annual charge to recover the cost of Tesco's risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities. Uh, Senator Carr talked about the cost and uh, made incredibly overblown uh, claims about the cost and the impacts. The subject of these bills is the creation of an annual charge to recover the cost of Tesco's risk monitoring and regulatory oversight activities. The annual charge for providers will be between $25,000 and $35,000 per annum once fully implemented. However, it will be phased in over three years. Providers will pay 20 per cent of the charge, that is between $22,000 and $35,000 a year in 2020, 50 per cent in 2023, and transitioning to 100 per cent in 2024. So, um, Senator Carr also asked about who it uh, is uh, applicable to. 
So prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, providers only paid application-based fees. The amount a provider paid depended on their specific circumstances, but in broad terms, uh, a university would pay around $15,000 a year and a non-university provider would pay between five and $85,000. Uh, the price raise is broad because providers without self-accrediting status pay to have their courses accredited. And the price increase is based on the number of courses themselves to be accredited. Uh, Senator Carr also wanted to know how the charge will be calculated. And I can confirm uh, to the Senate that the annual charge will cover the cost of delivering six regulatory activities. The first is concern uh, management and resolution. The second is risk assessment. The third is inquiries. The fourth is business support. The fifth guidance notice. And the, lastly, the sixth, stakeholder communication and engagement. So the consultation paper itself proposed the cost for delivering concern management and resolution act activities be proportionally uh, provided, uh, distributed amongst providers, factoring in each provider's size and also their student enrolments. For the remaining regulatory activities, the consultation paper itself proposed the cost be evenly split amongst providers at Tesco's estimates. The cost of delivery is the same regardless of provider size. For example, a risk assessment is a database process that takes the same effort for a provider that has 20 students or a large university with 40,000 students. And that, to me and to the government, seems eminently sensible. Now, uh, the last issue that Senator Carr asked about is what is going to be the impact on students of these new arrangements, and the answer is exactly nil. Uh, the annual charge will be charged to registered higher education providers, and this is not a cost for students. It is up to the higher education providers to determine how they cover this quite modest cost. Maximum student contributions for Commonwealth supported places are determined by the government and they will not increase. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. Thank you, uh, Minister. Now, Senator Faruqi, you were online before, but you seem to not be there. So I will. Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Sorry, Mr. actually, Chair. Senator Faruqi, you've. Um, do you wish to speak, Senator Faruqi? You're muted at the moment. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, Senator Faruqi. You don't want to speak? Okay. Well, um, you're not speaking unless I hear otherwise. So, um, think, I mean that politely. Senator Pratt. Uh, in closing this debate tonight, uh, all the minister has really outlined indeed the desire of this government to pass these costs on to students, particularly uh, for full fee paying. Uh, students, of course, the cost of regulation when it's passed on to them will naturally end up in their pocket. In some cases, this will include students who pay in effect 20 per cent interest to the government for their fees and in turn they will pay 20 per cent interest for the cost of regulation. So it's completely false for the minister to argue that the impact on students is nil. All the government's explanations have done tonight is really reassert uh, the desire of the government to pass on these charges. Indeed, the additional addendum that they've tabled tonight has said a decision to waive the annual charge for a period of time or for a particular class of higher education providers could not be taken lightly. Thank you. So the question, oh sorry, Minister. Uh, thank you. It would be remiss of me not to uh, rebut what Senator Pratt has just said. Um, Senator Pratt, I'm sure, was sitting here in the chamber when I specifically said this is not this very modest fee that has been worked out uh, very fairly is not a cost for students. It is up to higher education providers to determine how they will cover the cost, and the annual charge will be charged to registered higher education providers. And let me just remind uh, senators uh, that this, again, is a very modest charge that will be uh, factored in over the next three years, uh, 20 per cent next year, of between $25,000 and $35,000. So this, far from being a huge burden, uh, this is a fair fee-for-service uh, that the providers are currently getting from Texqua. 
So detail about how the charge was proposed to be calculated was set out on page 24 of Texas consultation paper, which I know has been uh, reviewed here in this place. Uh, large, so to comply with the Australian government charging framework, the amount of the charge has to be directly linked to the regulatory effort itself and the cost of that. The benefit derived from a service is not a factor in determining the amount of the fee or charge. If benefit were to be included as a factor, the charge would be considered a general tax. So I believe, and the government believes, that this is a fair measure and it is actually not a burden on students at all, quite the contrary to what Senator Pratt has just asserted. Senator, Chair, it's Marine. Could I ask a question? Uh, uh, Senator Faruqi, yes, then I'll come to you, Senator Carr. Senator Faruqi. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chair. I just want to ask the minister how she is assuring us that this is not a charge that will not pass on to students. Can you actually guarantee that, that that's not going to happen? And if universities um, haven't lost funding over so many years, how come there's thousands upon thousands of staff who have lost their jobs. I mean, I think it's completely disingenuous to say that universities aren't in strife and then to put on this thousand, tens of thousands of dollars of charge and say that the students won't be imp impacted. Minister, could you guarantee us that students won't be impacted? Uh, thank you. Uh, Minister. Oh, Minister. <laughs> uh, thank you. And I'll say for the third time, and I thank Senator Fruki for her question, uh, this is not a cost for students. I don't know how much clearer I can be or this government can be. Uh, for, and as, as I've said uh, several times now in the committee stage already, is that a university would pay around $15,000 per year. Uh, and again, it will be introduced over three years. So it, it, this, is not, this is not a charge for, against students. This is a charge to universities and non-university providers. Senator Carr. It's a very simple question. Show me which clause in the bill will prevent a university or a, a tertiary institution from passing on any fee increases to students. Minister. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Carr for that question. Uh, as Senator Carr would well know, is hex fees themselves are subject to legislation and they cannot be increased for students. So Senator, Senator Carr. There are many fees and charges that universities strike against students. Show me where in this bill that any of these charges the government's now levying cannot be passed on to students. Order, uh, order, uh, Minister. Thank you. Um, well, I think this is becoming a bit uh, tedious repetition in terms of questions, and I've said it is Senator very, Carr. very clear. Senator it is Pratt. very, very clear that this is a charge for the providers and for the institutions. This is not a, st a student charge. Senator Carr. Sen Senate, uh, Senator, uh, Senator Faruqi, do you wish the call? No. So the question before the, the chair is that the bills stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those to the contrary? Aye. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The, the no, noes have it. Division required? Yes. Ring, ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. So the question is that the bill stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
order. So there being 18 ayes and 16 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. The question now is that the bills be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency charges bill of 2021 and a related bill and agreed to them without amendments. Minister. Thank you. Uh, Madam Deputy President, I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is, the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that the bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe, aye. The, I believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that the motion is moved by the minister to read the bill a third time be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Brockman as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 18 ayes and 16 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to impose registered high, higher education provider charge and for related purposes. And a related bill. Uh, government business orders of the day number three, financial sector reform, Hain Royal Commission response, better advice, Bill 2021, second reading debate. Thank you. Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much. This bill implements a recommendation of the Hain Royal Commission as well as a recommendation from the Tax Practitioners Board Review Final Report. Specifically, the bill deals with Recommendation 210 of the Hain Royal Commission, which stated, the law shall be amended to establish a new disciplinary system for financial advisers that requires all financial advisers who provide personal financial advice to retail clients to be registered provides for a single central disciplinary body, requires Australian financial service licence holders to report serious compliance concerns to the disciplinary body and allows clients and other stakeholders to report information about the conduct 
of financial advisers to the disciplinary body. Now, we support the implementation of this recommendation, but we should also recognise the history of how we got here. This recommendation comes from a government that never wanted a royal commission into the financial services sector um, ever. It had previous forms, attending to water down the protections from the future of financial advice reforms, or FOFA, under the guise of red tape reduction. Then it voted 26 times against establishing the Royal Commission. Even after all the heartbreaking stories, the countless examples of bad behaviour, and of course we saw more of this as hearings actually took place and when the government was forced to, to establish a Royal Commission, and when Commissioner Hayne released first the interim report and then their final report in 2019. This bill expands the role of the Financial Services and Credit Panel within ASIC so that it takes on the functions of the single disciplinary body for financial advisers. This panel will be able to take a series of administrative actions against advisers, including warnings or reprimands, directions to undertake specific training, supervision, counselling or reporting, and orders suspending or cancelling an advisor's registration. The advisor can also be given an infringement notice or could be subject to a civil penalty handed down by a court. The bill also establishes a two-stage registration process for financial advisers and winds up the Financial Advisor Standards and Ethics Authority FASIA, with the standard setting functions transferred to the Treasury and remaining elements, including the administration of the advisor exam, transferred to ASIC. FASIA was established in 2017 by the then Treasurer, now Prime Minister. Now, Labor has always been supportive of reforms and in initiatives that support a professional, consumer-focused financial advice and services industry. But FASIA stands out as an abject failure in public policy and in administration. They went th through three CEOs in their first 18 months. They failed to produce standards in a way that was in any way timely or done in adequate fashion. Advisers were subjected to changes and complications to the exam process. Now, when it comes to these advisers, and I had the opportunity to speak to a few of them recently, it's astounding how the government has been treating them, particularly in the design and implementation of professional standards and how this will potentially impact on experienced advisers who may be forced out of the industry, taking away their many years of knowledge about and how best to serve their clients. As my colleague, the member for Whitlam, said in the other place, Labor will work with industry for solutions to these issues. That's why the member for Whitlam has written to the Treasurer to demand that he review ASIC's industry funding model and called for a greater recognition of specialisations and experience in the educational and exam standards for the many, call for the many callings across the financial advice industry. This is important. The pandemic has changed many things, including restructuring of business and household finances. It's caused retirees and those planning for retirement to consider financial strategies. So financial advice is important, and we want the government to get the regime that is in place right. The bill also deals with Recommendation 7.1 of the Tax Practitioners Board Review by introducing a single registration and disciplinary system for tax advisers. Labor supports the implementation of this recommendation. Labor will also officially move the second, or I'll move it now, the second reading amendment that's been circulated in my name. But before I conclude, I would like to address another second reading amendment that's been circulated, or will be, to this bill from Senator Patrick. It would have the effect of deferring debate on this bill until we actually see the regulations that implement the precise details of the legislation before us, and they have the chance to be scrutinised before a Senate committee. This government has made a real habit of delegating complex elements of Treasury legislation to regulations which are rarely made available to Senate committees when scrutinising legislation. The Senate Scrutiny of Delegated Legislations Committee and its government chair, Senator Farrah Bounty Wells, has consistently criticised the government for their lack of transparency in this regard. While Labor strongly supports the objectives of this bill, it suffers from the same issue. Senator Patrick is right to want to scrutinise the regulations being made under this bill. They will have a significant impact on the financial advice industry. It's unfortunate that the government has not been able to produce draft regulations in time for the Senate to scrutinise them along with this bill. I would note that late on Friday the government released a policy paper seeking feedback on two matters that will be covered by the regulations. 
with this feedback meant to inform the development of regulations. So perhaps they haven't even started drafting them yet. But I would note that at the same time the government said they won't be releasing regulations, and to be clear, they'd just be exposure draft regulations until later this year. It's only right that advisers, industry bodies and consumer groups should have the chance to provide feedback on the regulations that will implement this legislation, and therefore Labor will be supporting Senator Patrick's second reading amendment, which perhaps is why this bill isn't listed for debate in the Senate uh, tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Senator Gallagher, I was hoping you were going to go for you know, another six minutes, and uh, then we could all go and have some rest. But I'll, I'll jump to my feet and speak because of oh, my best six minutes. All right. I'll start where you finished, Senator Gallagher, and, and address Senator Patrick's second reading amendment, because I think uh, particularly those opposite who do uh, claim to be the opposition uh, party of, of government, you know, the, 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 the alternative government, you actually have to think through how legislation and regulation work together and how the primacy of this place makes what Senator Patrick asks for uh, almost impossible, particularly, particularly at the moment, and which you will have into the foreseeable future, a Senate with a, with a crossbench. Uh, if you had to produce effectively what you're asking for is final regulations with every piece of legislation, then you're not actually going to have regulations. You may as well put them all in the bill. No, well, not exactly, because that's not the way our Order. system of government functions. I'll take the interjection, Senator McKim. It's not the way our system of government functions. Regulations have a legitimate place. Now, if you're going to mount an argument, and I would possibly agree with you, Senator McKim, that regulations as a percentage of the total body of law have got significantly larger over the years, and that's a fault of uh, all sides of government. I, th I do think it is something the political process does need to attempt to rein in. But the idea that you can have final regulations prior to a bill being discussed in this place would be, in practice, impossible to manage. You need to have final legislation passed before you can finalise regulations. That goes without saying if you think about the way the law operates for just a little while. Now, can you have exposure drafts of regulations? Um, absolutely, and, and obviously that was discussed in Senator Gallagher's contribution. But the idea that you can somehow have final drafts of regulation before legislation is passed completely ignores the deliberative role of this place in actually amending primary legislation. How could you do that? How could you have final regulation, which is subsidiary, if you are presenting that before the legislation has gone through this place. It would be impossible. Now, to get to this bill, the Better Advice Bill. Now, the Better Advice Bill implements recommendations from the Hain Royal Commission. And as I've stood up and said before in this place, Royal Commissions are effectively reports to government, reports to society. They are not uh, tablets handed down from on high in stone. They need to be considered. They need to be considered in the light of the existing regulatory framework. They need to be considered in the light of practicality. They need to be considered in the light of reg um, regulatory burden that's already placed on a particular industry in the interim. So it's very important that we take our deliberative role in this place and the role of executive government seriously and actually consider what's coming out of uh, royal commissions and the way those recommendations should be implemented uh, to make them actually work in practice and recognise the reality of industries as they operate on the ground. And I think that it is very important to say that the vast majority, the vast majority of people working in the various parts of the financial advice industry did not act in, in a way that um, perhaps some of the 
many egregious, and there were many egregious examples at the Hain Royal Commission of behaviour, um, but that does not reflect the behaviour of the vast majority of participants in the financial advice industry. Uh, in fact, I personally, and, and, and I know many others, want to see a strong financial advice industry so that Australians, working Australians, Australians planning for their future, Australians who aspire to a higher standard of living uh, later in their lives or for their children should have the ability to seek out that high-quality professional advice and to be able to plan their affairs uh, in, in a way that enables them to achieve their, those aspirations. And I think that is a really important and fundamental goal that we set for this industry. And I think, in the main, the vast majority of financial advisers operating within a framework that they did at that time acted just in that way. However, um, there is need to simplify the regulatory system, and this bill does that um, by increasing regulatory alignment. In particular, this bill includes the creation of a single disciplinary model, moving from the standard setting functions, uh, moving the standard setting functions to the government, introducing annual registration requirements and removing duplicate regulation for tax advisers. The Financial Services and Credit Panel within, within ASIC will take on the role of the single disciplinary body and will be given new sanction powers. Uh, where the panel concludes that a breach has occurred, the panel can take a range of actions, including, isu including issuing an infringement notice, imposing an administrative sanction or recommending ASIC seek a civil penalty. Senator Brockman, uh, I, you'll be in continuation, and I propose that the Senate now adjourn. Senator Askew. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Over recent months, I've spoken in this place about some of Tasmania's celebrated leaders, like Joe and Damien Ed Lyons and the Hodgman family. These people were instrumental in shaping the Tasmanian political landscape. And today, as I once again reflect on some amazing Tasmanians, I want to speak more personally about two women who played a part in shaping the politician I am, the Honourable Sue Napier and Dr Vanessa Goodwin. Both of these women were strong, impressive leaders in politics and within the Tasmanian community. I had the pleasure of working with them both and saw firsthand the value of the service and commitment they gave to the Tasmanian parliament. The late Dr Vanessa Goodwin was a criminologist who served in the Tasmanian parliament as Attorney General, Minister for Justice and Minister for Corrections. With impressive academic qualifications and unique career experiences, Vanessa brought thoughtful and distinctive insights to her ministerial responsibilities, which were widely welcomed. Vanessa was a member of Tasmania's Legislative Council for Pembroke on Hobart's eastern shore between 2009 and 2017. While in opposition, Dr Goodwin researched strategies to improve the Tasmanian justice system, including prison reform, sentencing and youth crime prevention programs. She wanted to cut crime rates and put her research into action at the first opportunity. When the Hodgman Liberal government won power in 2014, Dr Goodwin was appointed to all three justice portfolios. She achieved a number of important reforms within the Tasmanian justice system during her time in Cabinet, with progress still continuing on some of those policies now. She also served as Minister for the Arts and Leader of the Government in the Legislative Council. Dr Goodwin's parliamentary career was shut, cut short by brain cancer in 2018. She was just 48. Her intellect and compassion were remembered by all sides of politics and the general public as they mourned her death. Born in 1969, Vanessa had grown up at Rose Bay and Acton on Hobart's eastern shore. She graduated from the University of Tasmania in 1993 with a Bachelor of Arts and Laws. One of her first jobs was as an associate to the then T Tasmanian Chief Justice, Guy Jet Green, later Sir Guy, and as a research assistant for the Tasmanian Governor, Vanessa also worked as a criminologist with the Department of Police and Public Safety researching and developing crime prevention tactics. She also studied a Master of Philosophy in Criminology at the University of Cambridge. Her thesis covered mass murders. 
a topic she revisited when completing her PhD with the University of Tasmania. Vanessa interviewed more than 50 maximum security inmates at Risdon Prison about their burglary habits for her doctorate. These male prisoners, some of them hardened criminals, happily shared their lives of crime with the softly spoken PhD candidate. Her report into intergenerational crime in 2009 showed an entrenched culture of welfare dependency, alcohol abuse, domestic violence and child neglect over successful generation, successive generations in some families. Dr Goodwin's involvement in politics began as a teenager when she helped her mother, Edith Langham Goodham, Goodwin OAM, to campaign in several elections for the Liberal Party. Vanessa later contested the House of Assembly seat of Franklin at the 2006 Tasmanian election and at the 2007 federal election. She was successfully elected in 2009, winning her seat as the member for Pembroke by a large margin and was re-elected in 2013. Her strong work ethic, determination and persistence quickly won the respect of colleagues, political opponents and the public. Outside of politics, Vanessa was a Churchill scholarship holder, a Rotarian and a fitness enthusiast. enthusiast. Her diagnosis with multiple brain tumours in 2017 came as a shock and generated a flood of public support. It was the same cancer that took the life of her mother the previous year. Vanessa resigned from the Tasmanian Parliament in October 2017 and died just five months later. A state funeral was held in St David's Cathedral in Hobart for Dr Goodwin, with former Premier Will Hodgman delivering the eulogy for his friend. He described Vanessa as a trailblazer who left Tasmania much poorer for her passing. The University of Tasmania and the Tasmanian Government established the Dr Vanessa Goodwin Law Reform Scholarship in her honour a fitting tribute to this remarkable Tasmanian woman. And as I mentioned earlier, I would also like to recognise Sue Napier, who famously campaigned using the slogan, the best man for the job is a woman, and she certainly was. Sue was the first woman to lead the Tasmanian Liberal Party and lead a major political party in the Tasmanian Parliament. Described as a small L Liberal, Sue served in numerous portfolios but was especially interested in Tasmanians having fair access to quality health and education. Her parliamentary career came to an untimely end in 2010 when she faced a second battle with breast cancer. Unfortunately, this time it was a battle she could not win. Born on the first day of 1948 at La Trobe in Tasmania's northwest, Susan Braid was one of three children for Harry and Maisie Braid. The Braids were farmers, but also active in Tasmanian politics. Sue's father, Henry, or Harry Braid, served in the Legislative Council between 1972 and 1990 and was president of the chamber in 1983-84. His cousin, Ian Braid, was a Liberal member for Wilmot, or now Lyons, twice during his political career, serving as a cabinet minister in the 1980s and 90s. Sue worked for the Tasmanian College of Advanced Education, which became the Tasmanian Institute of Technology and later the University of Tasmania, for 20 years from January 1972. Her specialist areas were physical education, sports psychology and motor learning. Sue became active in the Young Liberals in the 1970s and served as president of the organisation, later becoming a member of the Tasmanian Liberal Party. She resigned from her position at UTAS to stand as a Liberal candidate for Bass at the state election in 1992. Sue was successful, raising issues in her first speech that we are still grappling with today, almost 30 years later. Sue spoke about the need for caring communities, for Parliament to conduct itself with dignity and decorum, anti-discrimination legislation and action on domestic violence and the protection of minors from pornographic material. Sue also had strong opinions on the Tasmanian economy. She believed in reducing state debt, spending within the state's capacity and maintaining government accounts that accurately reflect the true financial situation. She stuck with these sentiments during her whole parliamentary career. Early in her 18-year parliamentary career, Sue was made Assistant Minister for Women and Youth Affairs, and in 1995 she was promoted to Minister for Transport, TT Line and Youth Affairs. She won a second term at the 1996 election and became Deputy Premier and Minister for Education, the Arts and Sport and Recreation. Topping the poll in Bass at the 1998 state election, Sue watched Labor rise under former union leader Jim Bacon. 
She became opposition leader in 1999 and served as the Shadow Minister for Health and Human Services, Racing, Sport and Recreation and Women between 2000 and 2006. She later took on a number of other shadow portfolios, including education and skills, environment, heritage and the arts, social inclusion and climate change. Sue was diagnosed, diagnosed with breast cancer in late 2008 and initially responded well to treatment. However, early in 2010, she announced she would retire from parliament and not contest the Tasmanian election that year as her cancer had returned. Outside politics, Sue served the Tasmanian community through positions on the Tasmanian Netball Association, University of Tasmania Academic Senate and the National Council of Women. She was a fellow of the Australian Council for Health, Physical Education and Recreation. Her personal interests included golf, fishing, walking the dog and spending the time with her loved family. Respected by all sides of politics for her work ethic, integrity and compassion, Sue was made a life member of the Liberal Party in 2010. Sue died from breast cancer in August 2010, aged 62, just months after her husband Drew died from esophageal cancer. They are survived by their sons James and Alex. And like Vanessa, in recognition of Sue's contribution to Tasmania and to education, the state government, with the support of all sides of politics, agreed to annually fund two education scholarships in her name to encourage and support deserving Tasmanians to become teachers, particularly those who might not otherwise be able to afford it. Both Vanessa Goodwin and Sue Napier left strong legacies within Tasmanian politics as role models for parliamentarians and especially women who aspire to enter politics, like myself. It was an honour to have been able to call them my friends. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I rise this evening to speak on the proposed National Mental Health and Suicide Prevention Agreement. In all the multitude of inquiries into the mental health system in Australia, the problems caused by fragmentation have been consistently identified by consumers and carers as creating an ad hoc patchwork of services that are difficult to navigate and access. This pandemic has clearly exposed this major problem. This issue featured again in many submissions and the recommendations of the Productivity Commission inquiry into mental health when it released its findings in November 2020. The lack of clear roles and responsibilities between the Commonwealth and the state and territory governments was identified as a major factor in this fragmentation. As part of the Australian government's response to the Productivity Commission's findings, the Prime Minister announced the development of a national agreement on mental health and suicide prevention to be agreed with the states and territories by November 2021, providing 12 months in total for its development. Implementation, implementing such a national agreement is one of the key actions identified in Mental Health Australia's Charter on Mental Health that was signed by over 110 organisations in the mental health sector. The announcement of a national agreement is promising, but it has been more than eight months since the announcement and there is little publicly available material about its development with no clear national consultation process. The Prime Minister indicated that National Cabinet had, est had established a health reform committee and this group would take accountability for delivering the national agreement. There's also a um, small strategic advisory group and the membership of this has not been widely formed uh, and pr uh, widely promoted. Its uh, advice to date is not public and it is not evident that this group has sought views from the sector on the development of the national agreement. The, me the mechanism for seeking the views of Australians with lived experience on, with mental ill health is not known. The peak body, Mental Health Australia, is not represented on the expert advisory committee overseeing the development of the national agreement, nor have they been asked to undertake a consultation with the sector in relation to its content. In the absence of alternatives, Mental Health Australia undertook its own consultation to inform the development of the national agreement. It's really quite astonishing that the peak mental health body of this country has not been invited to take part in the development of this national agreement. If we want this work and, its ab and of course, it's ab absolutely critical that, it, that we have to do this work, the government needs to take advice from experts and we need transparency around the consultation process. 
Why is it always so cloak and dagger with this government? It's also very concerning that consumers of mental health and people with lived experience are not being included either. Certainly it doesn't appear so. We cannot have a plan to address mental health and suicide prevention without genuine engagement with those with lived experience in mental ill health and inclusion of people with lived experience in the design, negotiation, implementation and ongoing monitoring of the national agreement. People with lived experience need to be partners with the government and to be part of the senior governance groups. The system must be genuinely consumer-centred, with consumers' needs at the forefront. The government, it appears, hasn't bothered to consult with the peak body on the national agreement, but Mental Health Australia has provided some comprehensive expert advice on how to make the, the agreement work and address fragmentation in the sector. They have taken the initiative. The advice to governments is a comprehensive view from the mental health sector on the reform opportunities prevented by the development um, and the potential of a national agreement. It contains structures, priorities and initiatives that can assist to improve outcomes for people with a lived experience of mental ill health and those who love and care for them. They highlighted six key areas for a successful national agreement. Firstly, the foundational principle that there must be involvement of people with lived experience of mental ill health in the development, implementation, oversight and evaluation of the agreement. Secondly, the need for clear accountability, coordination of activity and transparency of action and the need for first, first ministers to take responsibility for the outcomes of the agreement. Thirdly, there must be a commitment to long-term funding enhancements based on an objective reference point and that investment should be incre incrementally added to the system against a set of transparent priorities and with transparent gov governance and oversight. They then, that fourthly, governance and implementation mechanisms must include representation from the sector drawing on its expertise and recognise the, found, the foundational principle of the involvement of individuals with lived experience of mental ill health. Fifthly, there needs to be focus beyond the health system that include responses that address the social determinants and root causes of mental ill health and suicide including poverty, trauma and incarceration. And sixthly, the evaluation and measure measurement of outcomes built into the agreement must include whole of government measures that deal with long-term improved mental health and wellbeing for the whole community. We can't just let yet another government announcement that gets a headline and then we'll move on. This is more than a headline. It needs urgent action and the community needs to be adequately and properly consulted. We had a, f a fast evolving mental health crisis in this country and yet we, and we cannot miss this opportunity to implement a fit for purpose national mental health and suicide prevention agreement. This is simply too critical and important to treat in the apparent manner this government is treating this very important agreement. Without the input of the sector and people with lived experience, the national agreement will miss a significant opportunity to make a real difference in people's lives. This agreement, if done properly, if prepared properly, can make a real difference to people's lives. Unfortunately, perhaps we're going to get an agreement that features the ad hoc and fragmentation that so strongly characterises our mental health system in this country. We, the community, expect better. People with lived experience urgently need to be consulted on this important agreement. I urge the government to firstly update the community and the sector and Mental Health Australia and, their consu and consumer mental um, uh, ill health sector representatives and consumers, update them on where this agreement is up to and include them in a, as a matter of urgency in this process and listen and pay very close regard to the six key points that Mental Health Australia are pointing out 
that urgently need to be undertaken if we are going to have an agreement of which we can all be proud, but most importantly, delivers the results that are so urgently needed. Thank you, Senator Seward. The Senate stands adjourned and we'll meet again tomorrow at 12 noon. Thank you. Do you do naughty to have to get to